Well, howdy do everyone and welcome back to the ranch. Good to have you here today. And yeah, we're back in the shop again today, but this time it's because it's raining outside. Thank goodness. So we are not complaining. Anyway, good to have you here today. As promised, this video today is in response to a rabies video that I launched about three or four weeks ago. It was entitled something like scary uh, rabies at our house and it was about a little raccoon that came up that had rabies and my dogs got a hold of it so um, if you haven't seen that um, i'll put the link to that video in the description down below and that will sure help clear up a bunch of the things we're going to cover in this video so if you haven't seen it go watch it first and then come back so sadly today our video is not going to be one of our little fun videos that i usually put up this one's going to be more of an educational video kind of like sitting in a class in vet school sorry apologies up front here uh, and sadly today there's not going to be any little videos of the wildlife like you know the little ringtail cat well well okay maybe one one you get one okay see there you go this is going to be an educational video not one of those little cutesy videos like i usually put up i'm not going to show you even one video of my new baby granddaughter well well maybe well okay okay if you're going to be that way okay one video that's all you get But with all kidding aside, this is going to be a pretty serious video. Um, I'd really like for you guys to pay close attention to it because uh, your life could depend on it. Your life or your family's life or your pets. Because rabies is a very, very serious thing. And reflecting back on the comment section from last time is pretty scary. So anyway, that video got really, really popular. Picked up about 108,000 views, which is a lot for my little channel. I picked up about 1,000 subscribers from it as well. So if you are a new subscriber, if you just joined, thank you so much for doing so. I'm really happy that you're here. I hope you enjoy it. There are a bunch of wonderful, wonderful people that for some strange reason have kind of flocked together on this channel. It's kind of a, an oasis of kindness in the middle of the frequently ugly internet. But, but anyway, uh, God bless you all. It's, it's really wonderful to have you here today. I'm really proud to be here with you. So thanks for subscribing. I hope you enjoy it. We'll do our best to keep it interesting. Today's video is going to be pretty darn boring um, on, on some aspects, but super important on others and most of you that commented in the last video were kind of concerned about how my dogs were doing and how we're doing with it all and um, we're doing fine everyone seems to be acclimating the dogs are doing good uh, they're happy they're they're real friendly dogs anyway so they um, acclimated well to confinement though it's pretty obvious the 14 month old Labrador Retriever would really like to be out running around, but nevertheless, he's doing just fine. And, but thank you so much for asking and thanks for loving my dogs and my family as well. What I also worry about beyond the dogs and our family is the wildlife because this little rabid raccoon did not just fall out of the sky. I'm sure he was probably born right here on this ranch and he probably got rabies right here on this ranch from more than likely another raccoon. So it makes me wonder how many of them out there do we have? Have we seen the last of this rabies virus so far? And on my daily walks around this ranch, I've not seen any obvious bizarre behavior from any of the wildlife with the exception of this guy right here. I was watching these three axis bucks out in a little pasture we refer to as the meadow. This time, however, when the big boy saw me and decided to run away, he did take off, but when he got to the edge of the woods, I thought he was coming back on me. And I thought to myself, that's the last thing I need, a 300 pound deer that can run 40 miles an hour and jump a six foot fence. And he's got two three foot swords attached to his head, has got rabies and he's about to chase me down. But 
But basically what I think he was trying to tell me with all the foot stomping and the snorting and the screaming and everything else, I think he was trying to tell me that um, he didn't appreciate the fact that I snuck or sneaked or snake, um, that I approached him quietly um, and, uh, and, then, and then he just turned and got out of there. And going back to the comment section of the rabies video, it was very obvious that there was a lot of misconceptions about rabies virus. There's a lot of misinformation and just basically a lot of generalized ignorance about the virus itself, about the transmission, about the progression of the disease, about the treatment of the disease, and, and prevention of the disease. And my use of the term ignorance is not derogatory at all. It does not mean stupidity. It basically just means unschooled, or you have a poor understanding of a specific thing, like me and banking. I'm not stupid. Well, that's kind of debatable, but, but I am ignorant about banking. So all I'm saying is there's a lot of people that poorly understand the rabies process. And for all the people that had misconceptions about rabies virus and voiced them in the comment section, it's not their fault. It's the fault of our public health system. And I'm talking about everything from the state public health department to the health professionals in your area and my area, people like me veterinarians and medical doctors and basically the general education system in a whole this is one of the most deadly viruses on the planet it is endemic in the united states here it's all over the place in this united states yet the misconceptions about it are crazy so um, we need to do better as a country to educate ourselves it should be taught in schools. School kids should graduate from high school knowing everything about this disease and how to avoid it just to keep themselves safe. And it's not just on a local level and it's not just on a youth level either. When COVID virus came out, I told my wife as we watched everything unfolding that I could not believe how poorly understood virology and immunology is through our complete nation. Not just all the average lay people, but all the professionals and all the politicians, all the people that are in control of our country. And my goodness, look at the soapbox I just crawled upon. I will stop it right there, but um, just, just know that we need to do more to educate everyone in this country in virology and immunology, basically infectious disease because it's something you need to know about your entire life. Okay, let's let's go on to the next step. Sorry about that. All right, folks, so the rest of this video is going to be like a class in public health in vet school. So students, open your text to page one. Here we go. Rabies is a virus which is in the top 10 most deadly viruses according to mortality rates. It kills about 160 people a day. Sadly, about 40% of those are children. 95% of these cases are in Asia and Africa. And once infected and starting to show symptoms, be it a human or an animal, this disease is 99% fatal. And without treatment, it's 100% fatal. Transmission is usually from the saliva of an infected animal. It's transmitted by bites, scratches, and licks on broken skin and mucous membranes. It can also be in the tears and respiratory secretions from animals as well. The urine and feces are rarely infective, nor is the blood. Our common wildlife animals frequently serve as reservoirs for rabies virus. The most common reservoirs are foxes, skunks, raccoons, bats, jackals, mongooses, mongeese, gaggle of mons, um, these guys. 
and the virus can be transmitted to humans indirectly by saliva getting on the coats of your dog after a fight with a rabid animal. You should treat all dead, rabid animals just as if they're still alive. The rabies virus that comes out of their mouth in their saliva is infective until the saliva dries. The rabies virus inside the animal can be infective for up to three hours. Okay, students, please turn to page 234. Uh, symptoms of rabies virus are usually an acute change in animals or humans behavior plus or minus an unexplained progressive paralysis pretty common that's pretty much what I saw in my backyard in humans you will see dilations of the pupils hypersensitivity to sound light and temperature seizures hallucinations and just like I showed you last time hydrophobia the fear of water spasms when touching or seeing water also associated with the pain of swallowing the diagnosis of rabies in humans is first by having a history of contact with a rabid animal and also showing some of the early symptoms of rabies disease the only way to 100 percent confirm a rabies case in any human or any animal sadly must be done post-mortem. They have to go in and take pieces of your brain out. What to do in cases of exposure? If you, any member of your family or friends or your animals get exposed, if you have concerns, immediately call your physician or an ER, call your veterinarian, and also call your public health department. Those three things. Do not leave any of those out. And prevention of rabies virus is mostly accomplished by way of vaccines and awareness programs and avoidance of wild animals. And on the last rabies video, I made a comment about a rabid raccoon that I shot about four or five years ago that I found in broad daylight stumbling around and falling. And it was also in the time of year when we see most raccoon activity. And quite a few people shot me down on that. They said that you can see raccoons any time of the day. It's perfectly normal. They don't have uh, rabies. And they also said there is not a time of year when you see them more than other times of the year. And um, both of those comments, in a way they're right, in a way they're wrong. It depends on where you live. If you live in a city where the raccoons do not have any natural predators like coyotes and hunters, you're going to see those raccoons out through the day. And also you're going to see them out through the year. Basically what I was saying, and I even have a report from the state of Texas here that talks about how you see more rabies associated with the breeding time of the raccoons because they are much more social at that time and they spread the virus much more rapidly. And those are usually in the early springtime. There's always a peak of rabies at that time here in Texas, especially out on the ranches where majority of our problems are. And also the animals in the daylight. What we see here on the ranch is 99 times out of 100, the raccoons, you only see them on the cameras at night. Rarely we'll see one in the daytime. So it, it kind of depends on where you are. And I'm not saying those comments are wrong. I'm just saying in majority of the cases, especially like what I have here on the ranch, if you see and, and, and I'll just, I'll kind of change this up a little bit. For anybody, if you see a raccoon in broad daylight that's stumbling and falling around or is exceptionally friendly or exceptionally aggressive, or if it wants to play, there's something wrong there. And especially, like I said, if it's falling down, if it's hyper salivating, things of that nature, um, you know that's a recipe for a disaster you just with rabies 100 percent fatal you need to always err on the side of caution okay sorry i got a little bit loud on that didn't i apologize and we also had a lot of comments about is there rabies protection after the vaccine has expired 
and is it enough? Well, that's kind of an unanswerable question right there. There is some, and how long it lasts and how long it's good for, I don't know. Nobody really knows. I did see some studies where they checked some animals out, but the uh, results were not really dependable. Um, basically, when you give an animal a rabies vaccine that says it's a three-year vaccine, what that means is they know that at the end of three years that that animal will still be protected by that vaccine. Now, will it be protective at four? Will it be protective at five? Nobody knows because they didn't test them out that far. They just made sure that they had that vaccine to where it was still effective at three years. And then in all hopes that the person would bring his animal back and get him vaccinated again after that. And quite a few people got on to me. They said, Lee, you are a veterinarian and one of your dogs was overdue for a rabies vaccine. And some of the people were kind about it. And some of the people were not very kind at all about it. And I made a comment on there that when Marty got his last vaccines, it was right in the middle of when my son was being diagnosed with, treated for, and dying from cancer. And I don't know what happened to those papers that told me when Marty's next vaccines were due. I, uh, like, I, like I said, and I, I made a comment about this and I pinned the comment so everyone could see it and uh, still got ripped a little bit for it. But uh, basically, um, like I said, I, I don't feel good about missing my own dog's vaccine. Yeah, I'm a veterinarian and yeah, I let that lapse. But um, with all we had going on with Mark, um, I missed a lot that year, and uh, maybe you would do better, those of you who complained, maybe you would do better under that circumstance. I pray you never have to go through that, and if so, you are a better person than I am. And that's all I've got to say about that. And there were a few people that dissed me because I asked the lady from the state if she would define exactly what she meant by confinement. I wanted to know exactly what it was. And a lot of people said, you're a veterinarian. You should have known exactly what confinement is. Well, I'll tell you this. Um, I had in my practice lifetime since 1980, I probably had five cases that I was concerned about being rabies. And every time I called the state, and I asked them exactly what I should do because the state changes things. As we get smarter and research is going on, things change. The protocols change. The definitions of these terms change. And in a disease that's 100% fatal, it is a stupid man that thinks what he learned 40 years ago is still the way it should be treated today. And probably the most popular misconception was the 10 days quarantine thing. A lot of people said, Dr. Lee, your dog's getting uh, thrown in the box for six weeks and the other one 12 weeks. What's up with that? We thought it was 10 days. Well, once again, it's confusion because the state and the medical professionals have failed to educate the public correctly. The 10 day thing works like this. If your next door neighbor's dog bites your child and you wonder if he has rabies virus, one thing we do know for sure, if that dog had rabies virus in his saliva at the time of the bite, he will be graveyard dead in 10 days. That's part of that disease process. By the time the dog is infective, meaning the virus particles can be found in his saliva. That dog will be dead in 10 days. So if the dog's vaccinated, and, and again, the only way to check an animal is to cut his head off and send it to the lab and let him check his brain. You don't want to do that with every dog bite. That's pretty unpopular to the masses. Um, so what you do if the dog is vaccinated, then what they do is they quarantine the dog for 10 days. And if he's alive at the end of the 10 days, then that means that that dog did not have rabies virus in the saliva at the time he bit your child. And your child is just fine. You just treat them for infections, not for rabies at that point. 
So there you go. That's the 10 dice thing. The 10 dice is for the byte er, not the byte e. Okay? Good. Turn to page 312. One more misconception from the comment section. A lot of people commented they were shocked that I had to confine my dogs. Your dog, Rip, especially, who's very well vaccinated, why do you have to confine him, Dr. Lee? He's vaccinated. If the vaccines aren't that good, why vaccinate him at all? Well, here's the deal on that, and this is going to come as a surprise to a lot of you. Vaccines, there's not one vaccine out there today that is 100% efficacious, meaning there's not one vaccine out there today that will prevent the disease it's supposed to prevent 100% of the time. Rabies virus vaccine included. The vaccine that you took for smallpox, the vaccine you got for polio, the vaccine you got for diphtheria, the vaccine you got for measles, mumps, you name it, none of those vaccines is 100% protective. So if that's the case, and my dog gets bit by an animal that has a 100% fatal disease that's easily transmitted by saliva, and my dog gets bit by that, that's a dog that you can find. You do not want that dog out running around. You want to know if that dog gets sick. And it's not the 10 days thing. Remember, the 10 days is in the bite er, not the bite e. And in this case, my dog was the bite e. So Rip was well vaccinated. He will be in confinement for six weeks. He's got about two more weeks to go. A lot of people also ask about the oral vaccines. And uh, basically, the oral vaccines are used to control rabies outbreaks. No one can give their, in the state of Texas, I don't know anywhere else, you cannot give your own dog a rabies vaccine, whether it's an injectable vaccine or an oral vaccine. And basically here in the state of Texas, oral vaccines are used for outbreaks. And we had two epidemics in 1988. We had another one, I believe, in 1995. And they dropped about 54 million doses of rabies vaccine in Central and South Texas, right here where I live. And basically, they were targeting gray foxes at that time. But it also spilled over into the skunks and the raccoons. But uh, gray foxes were the biggest problem at that time. And they used oral vaccines in packets that they dropped out of airplanes. And it worked. And during those two epidemics, I, I don't know how many animals were infected, both, you know, what they assumed, wild animals and domestic animals. But I do know that two people died from rabies during those two epidemics. And it's very, very difficult to get a good count on how many animals have rabies in a particular area because the bold majority of the cases don't get checked at the lab. Most of them get shot and then thrown in a ditch somewhere and no one ever knows. And your next question in this public health class may be, Dr. Lee, what animals get rabies and what animals don't? Well, basically, any mammal can get rabies, but birds, fish, snakes, uh, critters like that usually don't. Rodents like uh, rats and mice and squirrels usually don't. Marsupials like possums are also resistant, nor do mice, hamsters, gerbils, and guinea pigs. They're not immune they're resistant. So it's basically a disease of mammals. So once again, just trying to do your best to stay away from rabies, have your animals vaccinated, um, be aware of what's going on and avoid contact with wild animals. If you have a situation similar to mine where I had to kill a raccoon in my backyard because he got in a fight with my animals, basically what you want to do is use all personal protective gear a head shield is good, a mask is good, eye pro is good, as is wearing gloves and a long sleeve shirt. You don't want to get any of the body fluids on you at all. What I did with this guy shot in my backyard, one, I shot him in the chest because I knew if I shot him in the head, they couldn't test him. Number two, I went out there with protective gear on. I had a trash bag. I put him in a trash bag. I rolled him up in that. I put him in a cooler 
not in the freezer, but in a cooler. I packed him with ice, and the next morning I called the local officials to come take care of him. That's the smart way. Be careful. And basically, when you're doing all this, you need to remember about rabies virus two truths. One, once symptoms show up, it's 100% fatal. And two, none of the vaccines, the ones our dogs get or the ones we get, are 100% effective. And if you have to go through an ordeal as I did, you have to remember this will be the most unforgiving virus you will ever encounter. And just doing a little housekeeping on this video, just to clear up a few misconceptions from the last video, my dogs, they're in cages and basically we don't let them out. We're not supposed to go in the cages unless it's an emergency. So basically, and what, uh, and one thing I did not make clear, we can clean the cages out, but we have to do it from the outside. So basically it's the old water hose thing. We spray it down with water hose. We change their bedding when it gets dirty and we have a way to feed the dogs inside the cage without going in there. So anyway, there it is. It did after I went back and after, after y'all made a lot of comments and went back and thought, yeah, I didn't, I did not clarify that. It sounded like the dogs were going to have to be standing in their excrement for six weeks. Not the case. I use a water hose. I spray it out. I clean the cage however many times it takes usually twice a day well folks that's about it for today i apologize for this video because i know it was a lot to endure but gosh it's so important that everyone knows what's going on so if you wouldn't mind i would really appreciate you passing this video around especially to your friends that have dogs have them go back and watch that first video about rabies and then have them come watch this one it'll make a whole lot more sense to them well students that's about it from out here on the ranch today and for all you new subscribers i promise you the next videos won't be anywhere near this boring class dismissed god bless you all thank you for being here i look forward to seeing you next time and i want you to always remember i love you how many of your professors told you that bye bye now So what you doing there, huh? Neutering a dog, Dad. All right. Who's going to learn you? That's a mistake.